and the program is about the Big Year Echo Challenge 2021. This is one of the most interesting and fascinating projects the Gloucester County Nature Club has ever taken on. Uh, it's been a, just a remarkable year. Uh, and uh, this is the brainchild of our speaker tonight, <coughs> Jeff Molinauer, and uh, uh, Eric Molinauer is also here helping out. He was also involved with, with, with the program and with the uh, documentary film that was made, which is available also <coughs> online, and you can get the link for that. Uh, but I know uh, Jeff is a, as an expert ornithologist, but he started using iNaturals to wild them. And it started opening up all sorts of other things in the natural world that don't have feathers. And uh, so from that came the idea, and we'll talk about that, of doing something with iNaturalists and with amateur naturalists to really make a difference in how we perceive the natural world and how we can find out about things around us. So I'll, I'll let them talk about the, uh, the basis of that. But I was a participant, as are some of the other folks here, for that entire year. Uh, and it was one of the most rewarding things I've ever done. So I want to have you give a very warm welcome to Jeff Molinauer and to uh, uh, <coughs> and Eric Molinauer. So thank you very much and welcome. Thank you. Uh, so last year, from January 21st, or, or from, from January 1st, 2021, all the way to December 31st, 2021, we did the Big Year Eco Challenge. It was a full year, it was a long year, um, and somehow we all made it through. It was a really great year for this project because of COVID. Many of us stayed local, we weren't able to travel very far, uh, and this type of project was perfect for staying local. Um, so basically, um, what we did was we used the app um, called iNaturalist uh, to survey the biodiversity at um, five of our local parks. Um, and we had a team of, of volunteers um, that helped to do that. And many of those uh, volunteers or participants in the project are sitting here um, tonight. So I just want to highlight some of those people that, that participated. Um, we have Eric Mullenhauer, we have the Barsadi's over there, we have Bob and Debbie Barsadi. Up in the front row we have um, Gail Cannon and Carl Anderson, um, Scott Barnes, uh, Rich, Rich Jokes was involved, um, Chris Hers behind Rich, and Marilyn Henry, uh, and, and Chris Mullenhauer. Uh, so all, the, uh, there's a number of people here tonight that um, spent a lot of their year last year surveying um, at these sites. Uh, and so, so what, what you do with iNaturalist is um, you go out and you try to get a picture or a sound recording of an organism and then you upload that to iNaturalist and even if you don't know what it is, um, other users on iNaturalist will help you identify that. Um, and then you can build a database of sightings um, at, at, your, at your park or at your site. Uh, and so we had five sites in the project. We had uh, Ceres Park, we had uh, tall pines and um, the uh, Elephant Swamp Trail and uh, Piney Hollow and Riverwinds uh, in our area. We had some other sites too beyond our area, but for tonight, I want to focus mainly on those uh, on the sightings that we're seeing in our area here. Uh, so, so what I want to do with the program tonight is basically just run through some of the some of the highlights to give you a feeling of of, of some of the amazing things that we saw during the project. And, um, and when I say what I'm about to present tonight is really just the tip of the iceberg, it, it, it is really just that. Um, I'm going to show you probably about 80 species that were seen during the project here in, in the slides tonight. But uh, at those five sites, we probably saw somewhere around 2,700 species. Um, so there's no way to cover all that it, it, tonight in, uh, in, in the short amount of time that we have, because I also want to provide some time at the end for some of our participants to maybe share some of their favorite moments from, from the project or uh, some of the favorite species that they saw as well. Um, so if you feel like, as I'm going through here, like, wait a minute, he didn't, he didn't put, you know, this type of organism in there, they're just, um, I, there's not enough room to get it all in, so, um, so I'm trying to highlight what I can uh, and, and maybe show you guys some things that you haven't thought of or haven't seen before. Um, all right, so 
Um, so just to highlight the, the sites real quick, um, uh, this is uh, Tall Pines. Um, that was one of, one of the sites, um, as I mentioned. Um, and we also had, uh, um, this is the shot of a uh, series uh, from some of our, from some of our uh, local area here. Um, and we had um, uh, the, the other three sites as well, uh, the, uh, the Piney Hollow, uh, River Winds, and um, Elephant, thank you. My, my son, Elephant. Yeah. <laughs> no, I can't remember that. Uh, but uh, so to start off with, uh, we did we did see birds throughout the year. We had uh, birds like blue grosbeak. beak. Um, we had birds like prothonotary warblers. Um, we had yellow-breasted chats, uh, especially at at, uh, at tall pines. Um, and we had scarlet tanagers. Um, but but. But what what uh, and we also had we had um, mammals like uh, like striped skunk, um, especially at the, at the Riverwind site. Uh, I know Gail, Gail and Carl got quite familiar with the skunks at their site because there's uh, some cat feeding stations there. And what else goes to the cat feeding stations? But skunks. You can see the skunk here right there, working its way through the cat feeding station. Also on iNaturalist, you can count not just seeing the animal, but signs of the animals. So if you find skulls like this uh, possum skull uh, that shows that there was a possum at your site, that counts as well. Um, almost every site had deer, um, white-tailed deer. But as we got further into the project, we started learning about things that maybe we didn't know about. Uh, a lot of us went into the project knowing about the birds and knowing about the mammals, uh, but we started to pick up um, Learning about things like dragonflies um, that we that we hadn't focused on much before. Uh, I know for, for me personally, this was like the first year that I really started to learn some of the insects, uh, and, and I started to find the dragonflies really fascinating. Like this uh, eastern amber wing, small dragonfly, uh, or the the um, twelve spotted skimmer, uh, eastern uh, pond hawk. The, um, the female here, bright green. Uh, and as, as you move into the fall, you start to get into autumn uh, meadowhawk, or I'm sorry, uh, um, uh, Halloween pennants. And, and autumn meadowhawks, uh, which was our, um, for, for anybody that has the hat, uh, that's the logo on our hat. That was kind of our uh, mascot for the project, the autumn meadowhawk, bright, uh, bright red abdomen. And then also we had um, we had some of the smaller dragonflies like uh, uh, like bluets uh, like this familiar bluet uh, and uh, uh, some of the the really flashy um, ebony um, jewel wings um, and overall um, we saw 19 different species of dragonflies. And, or, I'm sorry, 26 different species of dragonflies, 19 species of damselflies mm -hmm. on the project. Um, so again, this is just kind of highlighting a few of them, uh, but there were many. We saw, uh, I forgot to mention, but birds we saw 172 species, and mammals we saw 21 species. Um, also, uh, other types of flying insects, um, butterflies. We saw a number of butterfly species, um, 54 different butterfly, butterfly species. In the, in the early spring, um, you have the morning cloaks coming out, uh, eastern commas, uh, we, in, in some of the areas where we had red cedar, um, there was uh, juniper hair streaks, um, which uh, people could observe, um, uh, I believe it was the males, um, kind of defending their, their space on the juniper hair, or on the um, red cedars. Uh, and these are, these are smaller butterflies, um, as are uh, the uh, common um, uh, checkered skipper and, uh, and the zabulon skipper. 
in addition to the, the butterflies, uh, we also had a number of, of moth species. Um, we had nearly 200 moth species. So, so about 54 butterfly species and 200 some moth species. And I would venture that if we had done more sampling at night, that species, that moth species total would have been much higher. Um, just for some reference, I know there's there's a, there's a guy on my naturalist who, who samples nocturnally at night down in, in Cape May, um, and he's seen probably 900 some species of moths in, in Cape May. Um, so so 200, even though it seems high for us, is actually probably uh, is probably on the lower side for what we could have gotten. Uh, but a lot of people think of moths as kind of being, you know, the brown little things that you see on the side of your house. But there's actually some really pretty moths like this uh, chickweed geome uh, geometer, or the uh, orange patched um, smoky moth. And some of these moths you'll, you'll see out even uh, during the daytime. A lot of these ones that I'm showing were captured during the daytime, um, like this uh, Alanthus webworm. Uh, you'll, often, you'll see them um, sometimes on goldenrod in the fall, uh, or eight-spotted forester moths. Another pretty moth has like bright orange legs and big white spots on the back on little black wings. And in addition to the uh, adult moths and butterflies, we also saw a lot of uh, larvae or caterpillars. Um, some, some really neat uh, caterpillars like this Io moth caterpillar. Or I know at the, at the Riverwind site they had lots of the uh, Catalpa sphinx on, on the Catalpa trees there. And we also had, um, we had 32 species of bees that were seen uh, throughout the project. Uh, species like this uh, Lunate. Um, longhorn cuckoo bee. Cuckoo. <laughs> longhorn cuckoo. <laughs> uh, longhorn for the long antenna. Um, but one of the bees that was seen most often, especially in the early part of the spring, uh, were these unequal cellophane bees. Uh, many of our sites had uh, were able to find uh, the holes in the ground that these bees use. They, they burrow into the ground. They're one of the early species. Uh, because they, um, they pollinate uh, red maple. Uh, they use that pollen uh, to, uh, to feed their larvae inside, uh, inside the tunnels. Um, and so they're out, because red maple is out uh, uh, blooming so early, um, this is one of the species that takes advantage of that. Um, but uh, a, a lot of people did get to see them in their tunnels and just kind of, it's, uh, I know there's, there's some really good sites right here in Tall Pines where you can, you can go and just see uh, active areas where there's lots of tunneling right along the edges of the paths. Uh, but as soon as, uh, as soon as you start to get that, uh, those early spring bees that come out, you also get other bees that, um, that are not pollinators, but like this uh, nomad bee, um, that focuses more on uh, parasitizing some of the nests of those pollinating bee species. So, um, so all kinds of interesting relationships inside those inside the bee world. Um, also, some really uh, some really flashy, striking bees. Um, again, uh, you might not realize, but there is some bees that are almost like a metallic green color. Um, these are the sweat bees. Small, small, tiny little bee. Uh, but, but bright green. Uh, in addition to the bees, we had a number of wasps. Um, and in particular, I want to highlight uh, one group of wasps that we saw, and that was the gall wasps. Um, we had, uh, just in the gall wasps, um, we had 40 species of just gall wasps that were seen in the project. Um, and these gall wasps, you might, you might have seen things on leaves that look like you know, little imperfections in leaves or imperfections on the, on the stems of trees. And you might have heard those called galls before. Um, this here is a white oak club gall formed on, on white oak at the end of the branch here where the, where the buds are. 
Um, the galls I find so fascinating because it, essentially these, these tiny wasps, these gall wasps, are, most of them, the adults are not bigger than the size of an ant. Um, completely harmless, and not, not what you think of as like, when you hear wasp, you think of like a yellow jacket. Um, these are small, like ant-sized wasps. Uh, and they'll lay their, they'll lay their eggs uh, inside the tissue of the plant. And then the larvae uh, secretes uh, enzymes that essentially trick the plant into diverting nutrients to that part of the plant, which then creates the swelling for the gall in the plant tissue. And the larvae takes advantage of the extra nutrients and also the protection formed from the, from the swelling, and they develop within that, within that gall. Uh, but the, the gall wasps can actually be identified based on the gall. A lot of the adult wasps are not distinguishable um, from other gall wasps, but the actual gall structure that they make, if you know which plant it's on, you can identify it um, to the species level. And, and also where it is on the plant. That one was more associated with the buds. Um, this one is the banded bullet gall. Um, and also found on oaks. A lot of, a lot of the galls that we saw uh, during the project were associated with oaks, which is also really fascinating, um, all these uh, relationships with oaks. And these are all um, you know, native, native gall species, or gall wasps, uh, that have, have developed these complex relationships with the oaks. Uh, uh, this one is associated more with the, uh, with the branches. Uh, and then you have other, uh, other galls like this uh, fusiform oak apple gall, a uh, long, like, kind of like pointy structure. Um, you might be able to see a little hole right here. Um, anytime you see a little hole like that in a gall, that usually means that whatever's in the gall has since exited the gall. Um, it, it's developed and has, has emerged. Um, or you can you can have galls on on the leaves themselves. This is a woolly oak uh, woolly oak gall, and the galls aren't always on the oaks. Uh, this this one's on rose. Uh, this spiky looking structure right here is a gall. Um, that's the spiny uh, rose gall wasp. And one of my favorite groups. Um, that I, that I hadn't learned about um, prior was the, was the uh, flower flies. Um, and you might look at that and say, that's a wasp. Uh, and that's the really cool thing about these, <clears throat> these flower flies. A lot of them are mimics. Um, so they mimic uh, wasps or bees, uh, um, but they're completely harmless. And they're, they're such important pollinators. Um, a lot of them, uh, you, they're called flower flies because you find them associated with flowers. Uh, and we were able to find 33 species of these uh, flower flies, and there are, a lot of them are brightly colored. This one is the, the largest one we have here. It's called the Virginia Giant. Um, it's, it's about the size of like a bumblebee, uh, and, and when you hear it come by, it's, it makes like a buzzing sound, so you think it's a bee, because it, it also they, they mimic the sound of, of bees as well. Uh, but we had other species you might think that looks just like a honeybee, and that's because this is the common drone fly. Um, if you know honeybees, you know that they're from, they're not native, they're from, uh, from Europe. Common drone fly, also from Europe, but also here in the US. Um, so, uh, so it's kind of it's interesting that, that both the honeybee and the common drone fly have made it over to the US. Uh, other species like the um, longhorned meadow fly, and the yellow-legged bog fly, or the orange-backed uh, plushback. Um, so you can see a lot of interesting uh, color patterns within this group. Um, we had a, uh, 146 species of beetles that were seen, uh, including this uh, six-spotted neolema. Or the uh, gold-winged, uh, or the golden net-winged beetle, the locust borer uh, on, on goldenrod, the reticulated net-winged beetle, and uh, one of the one of the.
favorites was the tiger beetles. Um, a lot of people got to see the uh, six spotted tiger beetle, bright green. Um, you, you might not think it's a beetle because they fly up off the ground like, like a fly. Um, usually they're on like sandy pathways. Or you, again, you can see these over, they're, they're pretty common over tall pines on the paths around there. Um, you're just looking for something that's like metallic green that kind of like flies up ahead of you and then just lands on the ground again and flies up ahead and lands on the ground again. Um, then some of the things that, that are so small um, that, you, that they're so easy to miss are the springtails. Um, these are like a really primitive insect. Sometimes they're not even classified as insects. Um, and you might have heard them called snow fleas before. Um, this was one of the highlights for us last year was getting to, getting to see some of these on the snow. This is actually a picture of one. Um, you can see the snow in the background here, kind of the ice. Um, these springtails are so small, they just look like a little speck on the snow. Um, these, uh, uh, this one is a hypogastroid um, springtail. Uh, and I can show you the kind of roughly a size comparison here. There's about um, you know seven of them on the surface of a penny there. Um, so you can see uh, quite small. Um, they get the name springtail because they have uh, a tiny little appendage that's underneath here. You can see one there. You can see one sticking out there. They actually use that to like flick themselves up in the air. Uh, that's how they um, propel themselves around. Um, they kind of flinging themselves up in the air uh, from place to place. Um, they, they can kind of crawl slowly, but otherwise if they want to rapidly move to a new place, they, they flick themselves up in the air and then they, they can't always really control their landing. You can see they're kind of landing upside down here. Um, But we saw enough, we saw, we actually managed to find eight different species of these tiny little um, springtails. Um, you can see this one here is uh, a Homidia socia um, springtail. Um, fuzzy little back, this is a picture on, on moss. Um, so this is a close up view of, of the moss with the springtail. Um, this is one from, um, from tall pines on the, on the water surface in the creek. Um, a lot of times you can find the springtail on, on the surface of water as well. Um, if, you, if you ever find like really tiny little things that look like fleas on the surface of the water, that's probably these um, springtails. This is a Hydroisotoma schaeferi. A lot of the springtails don't have common names, just scientific names. Uh, this is uh, a globular springtail. Um, you can see this is on uh, uh, fungi. Uh, the springtail are so are very important, uh, they have a very important ecological role. Most of them uh, help to break down uh, fungi and, uh, and they're, they're found in the forest litter uh, under the leaves and they help to break down a lot of the, uh, the dead material in leaves. So they're, they play such an important role and yet we almost never uh, observe the springtails because they're so small. Like another um, Organism that's really small that goes unnoticed is slime molds, and we were able to find. Yay, it's here for the slime molds. Yay, yeah, yeah. the slime molds. Uh, Marilyn uh, and we got very into the slime molds in series, uh, and we were able to find 13 different species of slime molds throughout the project. Um, and slime molds, um, you might think they're a fungus, but they're not. Um, they're actually uh, protists. Uh, they can be. Uh, have like single cell uh, organisms, um, they're amoeba-like organisms, but then when they, um, uh, when they move into their reproductive structure, they kind of aggregate together and make these really neat structures. Um, and this one here is called a wasp's nest slime mold. Um, you can see the structure here um, where, the, where the, um, the spores have come out. It actually looks like uh, a wasp nest. Um, so. Uh, a lot of the slime molds have very uh, colorful names. Uh, this is the dog vomit slime mold. Um, the, the yellow here, um, some, some interesting person thought that looked like uh, dog vomit, I guess. Um, we have wolf's milk. Um, so these almost looks like pink bubble gum. Um, 
as it ages, they turn brown. Um, so this one was, was, was captured when, when it was very fresh. And a lot of the slime molds, um, they don't last um, the, more than a day or two sometimes. So you, need, you have to catch them at just the right time when they're, when they're very fresh. Otherwise, um, we kind of learned throughout the years, as people would find stuff and say, hey, I found this really cool slime mold. If you got out the next day, sometimes it wasn't there anymore. Um, we had salmon egg slime mold. Um, it looks like salmon roe or uh, chocolate tube slime mold. Um, so all kinds of there's 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 pretzel slime mold, there's carnival candy slime mold. Um, somebody had a really good time naming the slime molds. Uh, and then another one of my favorites that I didn't know much about until um, uh, I got some help from Carl uh, Anderson last year uh, was lichens. Um, this is a, a, a powder foot um, British soldier lichen, um, one of the uh, many species of, of Clodonia lichens um, that are found in our area. Uh, and uh, candle flame lichen. Uh, and then I should mention too, lichens are, are kind of a, a fascinating story too because uh, a lichen is a, kind of a combination of a fungi and an algae. Um, so the, the classification of, of these uh, lichens is, 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 is very complex because uh, they don't know whether to, sometimes scientists uh, don't know whether to classify them by, by the fungi or by, by the uh, algae component. And currently they're classified under, uh, by, by the fungi um, component. So you'll find lichens listed under, under fungi, but it's, it's a very kind of complex situation um, you have species uh, like the bushy beard lichen, or the, that's in the uh, Usnea genus, uh, also called like uh, like old man's beard. Where you might have species that are growing just on the sidewalk out by your house, like um, like sidewalk fire dot. Um, the bright, if you ever see like little uh, orange specks on your sidewalk, or uh, or little kind of reddish reddish specks, that might be sidewalk fire dot. If you take, take a closer look at it with like a hand lens, um, they're really uh, kind of an amazing pattern. Then we also had, um, oh, so, so we had about 52 species of lichens that were seen. Um, and uh, 365 species of fungi um, that were seen throughout the year. Uh, species like the ochre jelly club, uh, we had a number of these over at the Riverwind site. Uh, or, or one of my favorites was the white green algae coral that we found on a rotting log um, at Ceres Park. Um, it, again, it's, 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 a, um, it's a fungi that has association with algae, only in this case it's, it's it's easier to see that association than it is within the lichen. Um, but you can see the, the algae here, the green algae growing on the log, and then the, uh, the fungus or the, the coral fungus here growing, the white stalks growing out of, the, uh, out of the algae. But you have to have those two together in order to have this species. Uh, also, we have a lot of uh, different, different types of rusts uh, within the fungi family. Um, so this is an example of bay apple rust uh, growing on bay apple plants. Um, so a lot of these plants have a specific rust that grows with it, um, these bright orange um, colors. Or uh, a lot of the sites observe witch's butter, uh, a slimy kind of yellow uh, fungus that grows on, on uh, on, on the bark of, of dying trees. Um, also, uh, some, some very pretty like pink fungi, like the coral pink uh, Aruleus. Uh, we have larger uh, fungi, like uh, toadstools, like um, Old Man of the Woods and Fly Agaric, uh, some of the Amanita mushrooms. Uh, and we had um, we had lots of plants in the project as well. We had um, eight species of liverworts. Uh, probably the most common species that a lot of sites observed was the New York scalewort. Um, if you look on, uh, on the surface of trees, uh, 
you can find, uh, a lot of times you can find this New York scale wart. Uh, but we also had other species like, uh, like rust wart, uh, this colorful uh, red species that you'll find a lot of times on kind of those decaying uh, logs within the forest. Or some of the larger liverworts like greasewort, uh, this bright, uh, bright green, uh, kind of spreading uh, liverwort. We had uh, 22 species of ferns, uh, including species like this rock polypody fern. Or uh, cinnamon ferns, or uh, American royal fern. Um, so lots, lots of uh, lots of different ferns, and then we had uh, vascular plants, um, 884 species of vascular plants. Uh, so I really struggled with trying to figure out what to put in the uh, in the plant section. Uh, so I thought I'd start off by with some of the things that we saw early in the year that people were very excited about, and that was uh, the um, crane fly orchid. Um, especially kind of coming out of the winter months last year. Uh, that was one of the first things that people kind of started to pick up in the early plants. Um, and, and if you watch the video um, that, that we made for the project, there's a lot more information about the uh, brain fly work in the video. Um, that's one, kind of one of the highlights in the beginning of the video for, uh, as it starts in kind of the winter. Uh, but another spring plant that's out right now is, uh, is Spring Beauty. Um, they won't be around much longer, they're not on their way out. Uh, but um, these bright white, uh, white and pink flowers that come up uh, along the riverbanks. Uh, you can find them here at Tall Pines and uh, down by the bridge. There's, there's a nice patch down there. Um, but they also have a lot of these uh, early plants that come out have uh, insect associations with them as well. So, um, so you have the spring beauties, and then up here is probably a spring beauty minor bee, um, which uh, which helps to pollinate those um, those spring beauties. Uh, we also have yellow trap lilies, very pretty uh, yellow flower again, kind of uh, near the uh, stream banks. Uh, plants like Jack and Pulpit, and you can see the, uh, uh, the pulpit structure here. Uh, another one that's out right now, if, if you go through uh, Series Park, is the uh, Pinkster flowers. Very pretty pink flower. Uh, as you move later into the year, um, you start to get um, uh, trumpet vines come out. Uh, and you start to see a lot of uh, insects at some of the plants, um, uh, like um, a swamp blue stripe if you're in any wetland areas. Um, very pretty purple flower. And you get, uh, especially as you, as you move into autumn, uh, you start to hit the asters and the goldenrods. And, uh, and there's so many uh, insect associations with those uh, asters and goldenrods uh, that, uh, that you could just go stand by a patch of, of asters or goldenrods you know, for like an hour and just kind of like work your way through what, what insects are here. Um, so that is, uh, is, is the end uh, questions or, or comments. Uh, and I, I would like to uh, uh, give some time for anybody um, that participated in the um, uh, in the big year first before we do any questions. If, if they have any stories um, that they would like to share or favorite species, um, feel free to uh, chime in. Marilyn, all right. Okay, one. Of them. Well, um, I did Series Park, and um, Jane Reinard, who happens to live right in Series Park, or at least in the boundary of what Jeff set up, um, 
couldn't be here tonight, but she wrote this up and asked me to read it. So this kind of sums up what we felt about the project, and I'll just read it. So this is Jane speaking. First, although this was a friendly competition, make no mistake, the series team was in it to win it. <laughs> <laughs> and through the talents and dedication and Herculean efforts of our core team, Marilyn and Barb, we did. Going out together and our friendships is why my most value is my most valued takeaway from the Bayek. I happened to be the only person who lived within their territory, so I had a unique point of view and experience. It all started when I jumped out of bed to record a great horned owl hooting outside our bedroom window that woke me up on New Year's Day at 5.30 a.m. May have been the earliest. <laughs> I think it may be the first entry and Jeff would need to confirm. I was constantly running to grab my phone or camera since everything had to be, you know, have a picture or a recording. Throughout my house, bathroom, kitchen, basement, even getting observations while working from home during all types of yard work and when I should have been chilling on our deck, recording an observation. Sometimes I did feel like it did take over my life. How many of you would feel the same way? Varsati is yes. Yes, okay. Occasionally I would say to myself and anyone who would listen that we must be crazy to do this. <laughs> Bayek can be obsessive, especially when you live in it every day during the pandemic. Counterpoint is that it was a great distraction and relatively safe outside and outside activity during COVID, it gives you discipline, it forces you to notice what you might ordinarily overlook, ignore, or underappreciate. As usual, Eric made an insightful and telling observation when out filming with Ed Waters that he saw three of us who are primarily birders get excited about how cool fungus was. <laughs> so it was like, when you bird, you're like this. You know, you're listening, looking for movement, and a lot of these things that we had to look for didn't move or make sounds. For me, this is Jane talking, I really enjoyed exploring the different habitats in the territory, the challenge of strategizing to blanket as much of the territory as possible with observations and making the connections and conversations with the private owners in our series territory. So it wasn't just series park, but it went all the way to Lambs Road, to Pittman Road, and Barnesboro Road, I guess. And in that territory, other than the Pittman Golf Course, which we skirted, um, there were private uh, homes and properties where Jane knew the owners and she conned them into letting us go onto their property. Um, Gary, a neighbor, Mario, a neighbor, John, and the Herf family. So we went in two or three times to the Herf farm and um, found neat stuff there. She says, my favorite nature learning slash activities were the stories of species, interconnection like the crane fly and the crane fly orchid doing and doing moth night. We did set up a moth sheet one night on the front of her barn, and um, that was pretty cool. Um, I'd like to just add, for me, the slime tube mold was, or a tube slime, like the neatest thing. Because when I touched it, it was really little. But when I touched it, it poof, you know, it had like the puffing of the spores or whatever it was, like a smoke. And then two days later, it wasn't there. And I also wanted to add that I have about 20 pictures of unidentified objects <laughs> that I'm going to show to Carl. <laughs> and see, some of them look a lot like artificial plants that had blown into the park. And Ken and I found along the creek some green fuzzy thing that was half buried in sand and I have pictures to show you Carl but I'm pretty sure 
we decided that was a nylon rug. <laughs> <laughs> so it was fun. Is this real or is this man-made or is this an artificial flower that blew onto the onto the site? So it was a fun year. Um, we really had a lot of fun discovering what was out there and then looking at the other sites observations going well we didn't find that yet <laughs> so we need to figure out where that is at Ceres and um, the Barsadis they had an amazing amount of stuff and Carl and you, know, you guys found good stuff too so really good stuff and you did an awesome job just telling us, no, go back and get the acorn in the fall. <laughs> or, my favorite, you have to wait till that plant blooms. <laughs> so, that it, was, it was fun. And I would encourage anybody to, to give iNaturalist a chance. Because even if you're not in a project, just being able to take a picture of something and be curious enough to find out what it is, and someone will jump in and pretty much uh, you know, give you an identification, which is kind of fun. If you agree, I'll throw in my two cents. If you are working with plants, yes. and you get an identification, and you don't want to wait until <coughs> your dotage to get the answer, take the iNaturalist identification and then look it up and see, does this really look like what I see? Okay. Yeah. Then you can dig further. I mean, it's, it just opens a whole can of worms is well, what it does. You know, the entire floor of North America, the entire key to the floor of North America is available online. Oh, my. <laughs> I didn't hear that. <laughs> too, too much information. No, but if you know, say, well, I know this thing is in order. Okay. Key, you know, the key. Oh, okay. Or well, it looks if you look if if it gives you a name. Yes. You know, it says, says it's an orchid. Look it up. Is that does that fit? Okay. Thank you. Range means a lot. You know, I natural it's a little vague on they say, you know, it's found within your vicinity. Okay. But vicinity is within sixty five miles. Yeah. <laughs> that's so that, that covers, I yeah. think, maybe Jeff can answer this one. I think you can constrain that. You can say mm -hmm. within 25 miles. Mm -hmm. With 65 miles, you get into the Pocono Plateau. Mm -hmm. and a lot of species. I think they got better about restricting that as the year went along last year. I think when we started out in the beginning of the year, it was kind of like, very ambiguous as to how big can, that Can you cut that down, though? I don't think you can, I don't think there's anything you can do individually to kind of like, but when we first started the project, they didn't really, um, they didn't really have any filter to kind of filter for what was like close to you, and now they have something that's kind of like, is it close to me, or do you want to look at everything? Yeah, I said sometimes as, 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 as a like, or do you want to open it up to everything? Because the, the problem is, is that sometimes when you have an organism that is not very well documented in your area, then iNaturalists can't figure what it up. They can't, they can't have a good idea of what it is because it doesn't have any, a pool of, a big enough pool to choose from. But then sometimes if you open it up to the huge pool, you, get, you start to get weird things because it, you have too many possibilities that it could be. So. <laughs> yeah. Next. We are, we are among people who know things, and I have to tell you that I don't. But I have learned so much, and I have forgotten so much, but Carl and Gail, Jeff, Eric, and Chris are, are people that we walked around with and, and took advantage of their knowledge or their observations. Um, and uh, even on iNaturalist, Carl was very good at having conversations with me in the comments to help steer me to what to look for. We have to brag about Jeff because he was featured on iNaturalist at one point because he took an audio uh, recording of a special spider tapping. <laughs> what was it called, Jeff? The drumming sword wolf spider. 
Yeah, so pretty cool thing. <laughs> so, it's the first, the first audio recording of the Wolf Spider on that. Yeah, congratulations. <laughs> that was pretty awesome. Yeah. So, so uh, my, my favorite memory oh, has to be... One of the uh, favorite walks that we went on when we first met you two, uh, formerly on a walk, Carl and Gail, we, uh, we wandered into the woods at River Winds and we were looking at everything and then all of a sudden there were five adults down on their knees looking at the underbelly of these little tiny mushrooms. I think you featured them in the slide, the yellow stems. <laughs> they are all trying to get different uh, versions of uh, pictures and trying to figure out what this is and how special it was. Um, so I'm carrying this little walking stick because this is my first find. My friend looked at it and said it was junk because he kind of knew what it was, but I didn't. And what fascinated me was it was at Elephant Swamp Tail Trail and had been mowed down. So it just has these, let me see if I'm saying this right, lenticles? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, the pores along the bark of this young stem. And it, we call this trunk. And, uh, so I did a lot of research, which is something that I did tons of when we were uh, doing this project, and you go down rabbit holes. But I found out that this is a princess tree, and it is what my friend said, a junk tree. It's just invasive, but it's beautiful, especially right now, because it starts out blooming with gorgeous, gorgeous flowers, huge trees. Longwood Gardens actually features on their main walk. They have the, the biggest of these trees. Um, but this is gone, and I'm looking all through the project, and finally, as starting to get warmer, we noticed in the spot where I found this, this beautiful velvety green and purple leaf that was starting to unfurl. More research found out that that was the earliest sprout of this tree. Uh, it was just gorgeous. Um, the whole project went like that. We had some really fun times. Um, we took a picture of my husband's bug was going up in, in his hair and into his ear. Uh, that was at Piney Hollow. And we were all being trailed. Yeah, that was a good picture. <laughs> and uh, we yeah, were followed. You yeah, did stand still. I just had a stand still. Yeah. We have a tree expert that absolutely helped us with all the tree IDs and the galls. And what was your favorite gall? That it was one that looked like, kept saying, it looks like Christmas tree balls. Oh, the oh, oak apple balls. Yeah. Oh, that was yeah. so neat. Yeah. My favorite bug is the phantom crane fly, and it's described in so many really pretty ways, but it's a, uh, it looks like a, a, a snowflake flying or a dandelion puff that got loose, the whole thing intact. It's so beautiful if you ever see one of those phantom crane fly. Um, we're walking on Elephant Swamp Trail in the early spring and the pop of color was the flowering quince that doesn't really belong there, but it's there and it's gorgeous. Um, it, it just was a fascinating experience. Um, but the craziest one was uh, finding these sea serpent big things along Elmer Lake and I had no idea what they were. Uh, they were kind of, uh, I guess it was like golden with darker triangles on it. Turns out that they were the roots of water lilies. And they often, it, there's one leak somewhere I found out through my rabbit hole search that some people have, they are so big in one lake somewhere in the U.S. that they think they're sea serpents or they oh. tell their tourists that anyway. <laughs> but uh, the, it was pretty neat because in that process I learned more about foraging. So people actually wanted to know if this was a new nutritious snack you can have. <laughs> so there's YouTube videos about a dad cooking it and cooking it all this. So anyway, you don't need to know that, but you could go down the rabbit hole. We spent so much time on this project, but so so much personal growth. Some people do Sudoku, some people do crossword puzzles. We did a big year ego challenge. <laughs> and it was just fascinating. So uh, I'm so glad guys that you uh, you put this together. Thank you. Thank you. One of, the, one, of the, one of the big things is after the project's over, like when you walk through nature, it takes you a long time to really stick <laughs> But a lot of the folks that we hang with now know all about iNaturalism. When I'm out, in, out, in, 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 out on vacation, I'll talk to people about iNaturalism. Where did I get that? Where did I get that? But the coolest thing is our granddaughter. When we walk with our eight year old granddaughter anywhere, she always asks Nan for her phone so she can take a picture and see what she's looking at. <laughs> we'll do this in New York City. I mean, in, in, right, right in the middle of Central Park. You pull out the phone and start taking pictures. And so you, you can teach little kids that there's a lot of stuff out there. And, and she really likes it. She, she asks her for her phone all the time. <laughs> oh, I do have to. I do have to. Um,
counter the competition aspect of it. So, you know, more, pe more people saw more things and all that, but it was really cool to find the coolest things. <laughs> <laughs> and dog slime isn't part of that. <laughs> I think one of the weirdest looking things we saw was this, I think it's called the summer fish fly. It's a weird looking bug, and, and then there's, there's the, the, the beetle, it was the click beetle, with the big... Oh, with the big eye click beetle? The big eye click beetle, yeah, the big yeah, eye. Really cool. It's yeah, weird, yeah. there's some weird looking bugs out there. <laughs> yeah, there is. And when you see, you start seeing them, there's so many of them. I'll jump in. Um, I want to thank Jeff because uh, without his total commitment and enthusiasm, I don't think the project would have gotten off the ground. Um, I didn't have, at this time in my life, the energy to do what he did. Um, and so just a couple things that, that I think are important to say. Um, I think the real beneficiaries of, and I think you're sort of getting this by listening to Marilyn and Bob and Debbie and so on, uh, are the people who do it because you just make these amazing discoveries uh, and you realize like they've been here your whole life but you haven't seen them, like slime molds for example. You know, I'm, I'm in my early 70s and I'm just discovering slime molds, what else am I missing? <laughs> um, and they are, they're, I mean, we could do a whole program some night I'm sure on slime molds because there is such an interesting story there. Um, but, so, I think for me, one of the interesting things was as the year kept unfolding, day by day, week by week, different people made these really amazing discoveries. And like Marilyn said, once somebody found it, then you're like, well, wait a minute, how come we're not finding it at our site? Maybe it's here, too. Uh, I am uh, indebted to Marilyn to, for showing me that there are still salamanders in Ceres Park. I figured they were long gone because, you know, we've so damaged the environment here in South Jersey, uh, you wouldn't think there's any of that still around. But yeah, there's still, was it one or two species? I forget. That's why I thought it was two, yeah. Uh, of course, we won't tell you where they are. Because yeah. <laughs> and Marilyn would call us, like almost yeah. at dusk, and tell us that she found like a tube slime mold somewhere in Ceres Park, and we'd go out with a flashlight. <laughs> 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 And, and it, you know, some of the things that you saw were just so memorable and so exciting. One of the ones at Elephant Swamp Trail, when Jeff came back one night, he said, uh, you got to come see this. So we went down here the night or the next night, and he showed me uh, lichen-carrying lace wings. So uh, a lace wing is an insect, and it belongs to a particular group uh, uh, they're not beetles, they're not flies, they're not wasps, they're lace wings, they're noropterans. And um, this particular one, you're, here's a tree, like maybe a foot and a half, two feet in diameter. And it's covered here and there with lichens, green sort of like leafy lichens, like you would see plastered on the sides of a tree. And Jeff said, keep watching until one of them moves. And like, lichens don't move. They're stuck to the, to the tree, you know, like they're just plastered to the tree. Lichens don't, they don't have little feet. And then the more you looked, you realize like here's this little spot of lichen about the size of the top of a pencil. So think, think looking down on the top of the pencil where the eraser is. Here's a little piece of lichen and it's slowly moving up the tree. That's ridiculous. A lichen doesn't move. But what it is, is this particular insect cuts a little piece of the leafy lichen off and then puts it on its back where there's some hairs or spines or something like that so that it gets kind of stuck to the back. And then it conceals it. So it looks like a lichen until it moves. And it moves so slow that in general, like, you know, not too many things are going to see it moving. And the analysis that's been done of this like of the uh, lace wing is that they do it to be like a wolf in sheep's clothing right you know a wolf will dress up in sheep clothing so it can get into the herd well what typically lace wings eat are 
aphids. And aphids are like tiny little cattle, but they're juicy and they taste really good to, to a lace wing. And so to get into the colony where the lace, where the aphids are feeding, they need to disguise themselves because the aphids are being guarded by ants. Because ants use the aphids like cattle or sheep. And so they're guarding them. But if you come in with your piece of lichen, the ants don't recognize you as a threat. And then you eat some of the cattle. So it's just like, so, and I, I, I want to go with that idea that, like, so, you know, what Jeff showed all these pictures of all these different species, that's great. But that's the beginning of a lifelong pursuit. Um, you know, like, when you're in school, you can learn to play football, but, uh, you know, most people aren't going to play football when they're in their 30s and 40s and 50s. Then there's those life sports like swimming that you can do your whole life. And this is a life sport because knowing the names is only the beginning. Once you know it's a lichen carrying laceway, then you can start to unfold the whole story about why it carries the lichen and what's protecting the branch and how it fools them. And I'm sure there's much more to learn than that. So it's kind of like, this is Carl, this is Gail, this is Scott, this is Jackie, this is Dave. But that's all you know about them. You don't know anything. Just knowing their name is the beginning. It's knowing all the life story of the dog vomit slime mold <laughs> and how it relates to other things. So for example, the one that Jeff showed that uh, slime mold that uh, was pink and looked like bubble gum. That's the uh, wolf's milk. I don't know where, where it gets that name, wolf's milk. I don't think wolf's milk was pink, but anyway, it's the wolf's milk slime mold and it looks like little pink bubble gum stuck to a log. And what's cool about the project is because you're getting out there every day, hopefully, maybe not always, but you know, you start, to, you start to get out there more often. So the first day you see, oh, here it is. Here's the, this, is, this, is, this is wolf's milk slime mold. Look how, you know, hot pink it is. I'm going to come out tomorrow and see if it changes. And you come out the next day and it's not pink anymore. It's brown. And if you hadn't seen it the day before when it was pink, you would never be able to identify it that next day. But I decided I'm going to follow this through for three or four days. And so first day it's pink, second day it's brown, and I'm taking a picture of it when it's brown and nondescript compared to the brown log. And then when I get back home, I realize, oh, there's a, there's like, looks like some kind of a lightning bug. And then you try to figure out which lightning bug it is. And it's right next to the dog, or to the uh, wolf's milk slime mold. I wonder if it's an accident that it's there. The next day I come out and photograph it again, and this time it's not a um, firefly there next to the slime mold, which is still brown, but it's a different insect. It's more like a centipede kind of insect, and it's right next to the slime mold. And then come out the next day and the slime mold has completely poofed. It's like it's gone. Because really that that wolf's milk, little hot pink buttons, they're developing millions of spores in there. And when it's time for those spores to go, just they burst and it's gone. So over a period of about four or five days I got to see quite a bit. But it kept bothering me about why was there on the one day, a firefly there, why was there the next day something like a centipede kind of insect there? And the more research I did, somebody talked about research, I realized from some of the studies that have been done that those spores, when it goes poof, they need to be transported. And they're transported on the bodies and the feet of the insects that come there. So something must be attracting the insects. I'm not sure what feature of the slime mold, whether it has an odor, whether there's something that's edible, but 
those little insects have a beneficial relationship to the reproduction of the slime mold. So you start to see like a bigger picture. It's not just a slime mold, but it's in partnership with insects, which are in partnership with plants, which are in partnership with all sorts of things. So it's, it's like you say, it's a lifelong sport. So I want to thank everybody who was involved because we kept seeing and hearing these different stories as the year unfolded. And it was kind of exciting to rush out to Ceres Park to see the chocolate tube slime mold or rush over to uh, Elephant Swamp to see something that uh, Bob and Debbie found and so on. Or over to Tall Pines with Rich's group. So I'm done. Somebody thank else. You. Anybody else? Oh, just briefly. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I'm with the group that did Tall Pines. And one of the reasons I, I'm so excited about this, about this program was we didn't know what was in Tall Pines. Here's a, a, a state park, a uh, public uh, reserve natural area, and a, a part from a, a survey that was done for Woody Plants by Carl in 2008. And some sightings on eBirds and birds seen there, we didn't have a clue. Nobody knew what was in Tall Pines. And over the course of the year, our, our group made over 2,800 observations and identified 1,000 species of organisms. And now we know so much more about that. And we were able to take that, uh, that, da that data and actually uh, do a, a site evaluation and, uh, and, uh, and uh, organize this uh, of species, taxonomically listed by. Uh, this is for, for all the plants and animals and uh, fungi that we, we saw there. So we have a body of information now that, that, that is available. It gives you a baseline for what tall pines was in 2021 with so much more information than we had before. And I think that's a very valuable thing for the park. For myself, it was, it was like a treasure hunt. And um, when you go out into a place that it is familiar to, some place you've been, it's like going out in your backyard. You know everything in your backyard, don't you? Well, no, you don't. <laughs> and so, starting with the fall and what they call the winter uh, annuals, those little things come up. So those, those <clears throat> inconspicuous plants have been grown in very early spring and went late winter. And um, just going back to the same place, time after time, over the seasons, and seeing the changes and seeing things you would not have expected, as well as the things you do expect. Uh, it's just an immense pleasure to get to know a place fully. And I haven't got to that point yet, but it's like going from darkness to dawn. Uh, and so, some of the things I found that were just so interesting was one of the very first days, Christmas, if you might remember this, we were photographing a, a parchment from the log heads with some, uh, uh, what was that, what was on there, slugs. I said, oh, that's it. I got the photograph home, and I downloaded it to my computer so I could see it full scale. And there were globular spring tails all over the place. I didn't see them with the naked eye. I think that was wonderful. I was amazed by these spring beauty minor. I never heard of the spring beauty minor. There were about 4,000 native species of birds and of uh, bees in North America. But here we have a, a, a small burrowing bee that is in a direct symbiotic relationship with, with spring beauty, which blooms in early spring, one of the first things you see in the woods. Uh, one of the most interesting things I saw was in, was in the fall. I saw this fly that was on the top of a sprig of uh, dry grass. And I photographed the fly, and he didn't move. The well, fly was dead. Turns out what I was photographing was a fly that had been killed by the fly death fungus. And so I actually had two observations. <laughs> one for the fly, one for the fungus. It was a wonderful experience for the year, and I'll never forget it. It's, uh, you know, when you learn something like that, it stays with you. And uh, I want to thank Jeff for putting this, this program and this project together. I think a lot of us really uh, have benefited from it and, and enjoyed it, and it's enriched our lives. So thank you. Absolutely. It was a, it was a great... Um it was a great year on my part. I, I, I couldn't have imagined how, um, uh, how how everybody would get as into it as I was, um, and uh, so it, it was a lot of fun. I, I, Rich mentioned um, like uh, you think you know your own backyard, um, 
it's funny because in the past um, few weeks, um, you, you would think as much as we went out and surveyed um, last year with as many of us that there was, that we would have covered the area really well. But as I've had time in the past few weeks, if I have a half hour or an hour to get outside, sometimes I just go out in the backyard and photograph stuff in the yard. And we have new siding on the house, so the house is like perfectly yellow right now. So it's very easy, the bugs stand out really well on it. And so I've just been taking close-ups. And I can get seven new species that we didn't have last year in a day. <laughs> but I worry so. what our neighbors think. <laughs> <laughs>
unless there's anything else, I guess that's, uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.